So thanks for coming. Um, I think that uh, this talk is going to be the one where we have by far the most amounts of like beta, alpha, fresh off the presses software in this conference. Um, I've got a uh, random build of Windows 7 running up here with um, various versions of uh, unreleased products and C sharp things and all sorts of stuff. So I think we're going to have a lot of fun here, or we're just going to blow up spectacularly, right? One way or another. Um, you know, I certainly can blame all sorts of other stuff, right, for this thing blowing up. Now, I wanted to uh, talk a bit about where we are today with uh, with Ruby um, and an Iron Ruby. I think that where things have kind of changed the most um, since the last time I saw all you guys was uh, certainly we've had a year to, uh, to write more code, which is a good thing. Um, the second thing is, um, as of late, we've kind of focused on some interop scenarios, which I'm going to be spending most of the talk today talking about. Um, and by interop, it's really asking or answering the question, why would you want to use Iron Ruby in the first place? And it's really if you want to talk to .NET code, right? If you're not interested in talking to .NET code, there really isn't an awful lot of reason for you to be um, using Iron Ruby. There's plenty of other things you can use. Um, but if you are interested in interopping with .NET code, um, either by hosting Ruby, um, Iron Ruby inside of one of your existing applications, or perhaps um, you know, just going off and uh, um, talking to Ruby code from from your your from, or, or talking to sorry your .NET code from Ruby scripts. You know, those are the two kind of key scenarios that you know that we think are important to folks that want to use it. Um, I'm going to leave all that status stuff about where we're at and you know and all that stuff for the very end of the talk. So so we'll talk about that there. But I thought I'd start off with by. Um, by kind of talking about the things that I find particularly interesting about Ruby, which is the interactive nature of, of, the, uh, of, uh, of the language. Um, certainly most of you guys in this room um, spend a lot of time in Herb, right, and rightfully so. Um, and I wanted to essentially try and spend as much time as we can inside of Herb. Um, and I thought, what better way of kind of showing off uh, um, where our Ruby today is today, but by kind of building our own Herb, right, building a REPL. Um, and this first part of the talk is going to show you how to host um, Iron Ruby inside of an existing application that you might have already. I'm right, going to show you essentially the set of hosting interfaces we have, um, which make it very, very straightforward for you to go off and do exactly that, right? which is take some chunk of code um, and execute it um, inside of um, Iron Ruby. So I'm going to start off here with this, this, uh, um, this WPF application. Um, this WPF application just kind of goes up and uh, throws up a big blank screen um, with an area where you can go off and type some stuff into. There's lots of crazy software running on my machine. I'm paging in the world right now, right? So um, this is in the normal state of affairs. Okay, there we go. So I can say hello, and this thing just simply goes off and echoes it, right? So what we're going to do is we're going to change this thing so that we're going to take what was typed in up at the top there, and we're going to run it through Iron Ruby, right, and throw the results back out um, onto this uh, rendering surface um, that we have here. So the first thing we have to do is add some references to a few assemblies. Um, the assemblies that we need to add some references to are um, the Iron Ruby assembly, certainly there's two of those guys, um, and the three um, DLR assemblies that we have as well. So we come over here, we'll come in here, we'll see that, uh, whoa, we'll see those guys later. So these are the five assemblies we'll add references to in here. Um, once we've got those things added inside of our project, um, we're now free to go off and construct an instance of the Iron Ruby engine. And from the Iron Ruby engine, we'll just go off and get it to, uh, to execute a little bit of code on our behalf. So coming up to here, let's, uh, let's go off and create an instance of this engine. Let's kind of drop a, a field in here first. Um, this is a script engine. All right, we'll create one of these guys. And in here, we'll just go off and initialize it. Now, what's cool about this thing that I'm going to show you next is we're going to not just to create an instance of the engine, we're going to initialize it to, um, to some set of things. Right? There's options that you can certainly provide to your compiler. What's particularly interesting about this, these interfaces, we're using a wrapper here with ruby.createEngine. There's a more generic set of interfaces that sit behind this thing so that you can certainly use exactly the same set of interfaces. These are the DLR hosting interfaces to host any arbitrary DLR scripting language um, inside of your application. Right? So by essentially changing the name of the, the, the engine that you want, be it C Sharp, which we'll show you later, right? or other things like you know, Iron Python, 
um, you can simply go off and have exactly the same chunk of code, um, but switch arbitrary engines at runtime, right? Or embed arbitrary um, DLR scripting engines at runtime. Anyone here seen the new C sharp four syntax? Yeah, so at least one guy here, right? So what I'm showing you, so C sharp three syntax, I'm getting ahead of myself. Um, so the, uh, the C sharp three syntax, this is a delegate that we're creating. We're creating an anonymous delegate. Um, there's a parameter set up there. Um, we're type inferring what the type of setup is in there. So there is the parameter list inside of the first set of prints with a setup inside of it. Now inside of the curly braces, I'm gonna go off and define um, the, um, the, the delegate or the block, or right, the block-like thing. So I can go off and say setup.options and interpret it. We'll set this thing to true. All right, so I've gone off and created this thing and I got a, there's a little bit more punctuation that I need in this language, so I'll add that. Um, so I'm gonna turn on the interpreter mode. One of the things we have inside of um, the current version of Iron Ruby today is by default we compile everything, right? And certainly for, if you're gonna default to compiling everything from the get-go and you're just executing code inside of a REPL, right? It doesn't make an awful lot of sense to do that since you're just kind of throwing dynamically typed in code at this thing. So rather than us going off and compiling everything, what we'll do is we'll execute things inside of the DLR interpreter. This is the interpreter that we use for all of the DLR languages. Um, we'll interpret using that thing, um, and then we'll, we'll do some other stuff, right? So we've gone off and we've created our engine right here. And let's go down to here where I just have this little chunk here which inserts some text, right? So let's go grab that text first. Oops, oh, I hate this. Okay, so I've got the code sitting in there now, and now let's go off and evaluate this and grab the result. So remember I have the engine that I created um, up in my constructor earlier, and I can go off and execute the code that we just typed in there. I can take the result of this. I'm gonna put a little bit of a guard clause in here to test for null here. All right, so we can match the Ruby semantics a little bit better for this thing here. And then what we'll do is um, we'll just say result.toString, and we'll insert the result of whatever we typed in and we'll print it back out. All right, so that's essentially the sum total of everything that you need to type in um, to go off and take um, Iron Ruby or with a few more lines of code an arbitrary DLR scripting language embedded inside of an existing C Sharp language um, or application and, and run it. So go off and run this guy now. All right, so certainly we should be able to add numbers, right? We should be able to add, define a Ruby method We'll do that, right? And so we get that, right? So, you know, in what, like a few minutes, we were able to go off and take some, um, the Iron Ruby thing and embed it into, um, wow, that's not very contrasty up there. Um, embed this thing inside of uh, uh, an existing application. So that's the first thing that, that me and I wanna do. The second thing that I wanna talk a bit about is, um, so we've taken um, the Ruby scripting engine and embedded it into something. Now let's try and do some other Ruby-esque things inside of our REPL. Um, one of the interesting things about REPL certainly is that we have the ability um, you know, to, to evaluate not just a chunk of code, right? But we wanna be able to evaluate the chunk of code, grab the result, right? So we've already got the result there sitting in result. But what we would like to do next is let's take that and let's invoke something, right? So let's invoke something on that object. I've got an object reference now, right? So rather than doing everything as strings like we had before, let's go off and invoke a method on that object reference that we just got back. Does that make sense? So two things I wanna um, now show you is how we can go off and, you know, from C Sharp again, just add a reference um, to an existing Ruby file. Um, and the second thing that I wanna show you is um, once we're inside of this thing, once we've, we've kind of added a reference to something, let's go off and invoke that, that thing. So what I wanna show you is um, how we're gonna take the object um, that we got back and we're gonna invoke a little helper method. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna monkey patch object. We'll add a little helper method which will convert things to XAML um, for us. So I'll take a to XAML method. Um, that's gonna return to me at least initially a string and then we're gonna extend this thing a little bit more um, later on in this talk. And 
what we'll do is we'll just print the results out, right? So we're going to pass it back to Ruby to do something, and we'll take the results and, um, and display it on the screen. So let's get out of this guy here. Oops. Yeah, let's show you the solution. Rather than watching me type stuff, I'm going to show you a few other things in here. So um, inside of this project, I want to show you this file. So default, default viewer.rb um, is simply a, a Ruby file that does the monkey patching thing that I talked about before, right? So it adds a to XAML method um, up at the top there, which simply says, you know, equals equals and the result of converting myself back into a string, right? And printing out my string representation there. So that's the, the kind of universal chunk of code that I have there. What I'm going to do next here is I'm going to show you the two little bits of magic, right? So remember, this was the same stuff that we saw there before. Right down here, what I'm going to do is I'm going to require the Ruby file, right? So again, walking up to the engine, this is a Ruby engine. So I have a require Ruby file uh, method on there, and I'm just going to go off and grab that default viewer.rb file. Once I've got that, let's scroll down here to the interesting part. And this is where all of the action is here. Right, so var obj, I'm going to walk up to our engine, given the operations, and I'm going to invoke a member. Right? So remember, result was what I got back from initially evaluating the thing. Right? So I've evaled the expression, say it's 3 plus 4, return me back a 7, which is a fixed num. Right? I've now got the fixed num object, and now I want to go off and invoke the to XAML method on it. Now, since I had earlier required right, that default viewer program, Right, the default viewer program is monkey patched object. I have a two XAML method on this thing. Right, so this will go off and do the invocation for me. So set a breakpoint in this. And let's run the app again. So we're going to evaluate this guy here. And if we just kind of hover over this thing, that's a little bit tough to see, but that's, uh, that says seven, right, on the tooltip there, you know, above the result, right? So we've done the evaluation. We've got this guy back. Um, he's now a seven. Now we're going to go off and invoke um, this to XAML thing. And now what you'll see is, is that obj is now um, equals equals 7. Right, again, you know, you know, imagine that it says that, um, but it does. Um, so it says equals equals 7. So we now have the result of this thing. And if we continue running this thing, come back out, right, you'll, we'll see that that's what it printed it back out to the screen. So I have the ability now certainly to go off, require arbitrary chunks of Ruby code into my C Sharp programs, um, invoke on that code. Um, you know, on a per object basis, right, or on any arbitrary object that I get back from Iron Ruby, I can store these things, manipulate them from C Sharp if that's what I want to do, and then send the results back, right? So it's this kind of interop which really makes, you know, Iron Ruby particularly interesting to people that um, want to go off and do some interesting .NET things. Now, kind of taking this idea about REPLs a little bit further, um, the value of REPLs is really, and especially if you kind of combine them with something that isn't just about text, right? The problem with consoles is that consoles are just about text. Um, if we have a richer rendering surface and just something that supports a character mode interface, um, we can go off and render arbitrary things in a more interesting way, right? Um, so the next um, part of this thing, what we're going to do is we're going to take the same idea, which is um, I've got these viewers, right? And these viewers are just these Ruby scripts. I can take these viewer scripts um, and build arbitrary viewers for arbitrary types, right? And since I have a graphical surface here, I can stick arbitrary things in there. So let's take a look at um, the next step of this demo. So if we look at part three, um, a few other things change here, but the file I want to show you now inside of part three You'll notice that there are two of these viewer things. There's this crazy looking system dot blah, 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 create that thing, right? System, windows, media, imaging, bitmap image viewer, right? So um, inside of WPF, which is the Windows Presentation Foundation um, um, user interface library, um, we have bitmap images, like you have bitmap images in virtually every other kind of UI library. Um, what I want to do is if I go off and run this thing and I get one of these guys back, right? If I get a bitmap image thing, I want to inspect the type of the result that I got from evaling the expression that the user typed into the REPL, right? Once I've got the expression type, I want to go off, once, once I've got the object, right, that was returned, I want to inspect its type, right, get back its class name. You'll notice that's why I have this scary looking 
um, file name up there because a scary looking file name is the type name with .viewer.rb appended to the end of it. I will dynamically load in the viewer right, for that thing um, using the require mechanism. And once I've got that thing loaded, I can essentially dynamically expand my REPL, right? My REPL can now um, come back and allow me to build custom viewers in script for arbitrary types, you know, um, and, and certainly your user-defined types as well. So all this thing does is it monkey patches um, the, uh, the bitmap image type. And that, of course, is a WPF type, right? So what we're now doing is we're opening up an existing .NET class um, we're adding our toXAML method um, that we have there. Um, what our toXAML does is this is just a bunch of WPF stuff, right? So it does a bunch of WPF things that are required to go off and display a picture um, on the screen. Details aren't particularly important in here. What is important is the fact that, you know, our view of the .NET type system from Iron Ruby is the same as the Ruby type system is from the perspective of a Ruby programmer. And that is all types are open at all times. We can go off and monkey patch these things and, and do the usual uh, metaprogramming tricks that you're used to um, on the other world. So we've got that thing there. Um, let's run this guy. It was over here. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go and grab the scary looking chunk of text that I'm gonna type in. Uh, right here. Oops, not there. A lot of this scary looking chunk of text. Oops. We'll do that. So, you know, it is kind of cool, right? There are a lot of things that we can do here. Um, the scary looking chunk of text is I'm gonna require some assemblies um, that I need. Those are the assemblies that contain the types that I happen to be using. Um, presentation core is the assembly that contains bitmap image, right? And system is the assembly that contains the URI type. Um, so what I all, I, all I did was I went off and grabbed some image I was lying around on my desktop and, and constructed it, of course, and since that was the last thing that was evaluated, the result was passed back to C Sharp. Right? We can actually see this run a little bit better inside of the debugger. Let's do it that way. Right, so right here. Let's see the different steps that we have inside of this code. So we'll paste the same chunk of code back in up here, and we'll run that. So when we execute the code here, I've got a result there, and this is a, um, that's the bitmap source object um, that was returned to me. Once I've got that, I can go off and grab his class name. So the fully qualified class name is System Windows Media Imaging Bitmap Image that comes out of there. I'm gonna you know, do the little guard to test that it exists and then require that, that Ruby viewer file in this case. We've done the require. Now again, we're gonna go off and invoke that toXAML um, uh, method. toXAML returns me back an object and that object in this case here is a paragraph object. Right? Because if we go back to the code here, you'll see that the thing that's actually returned from the toXAML method here, oops, is a paragraph that's newed up and P is the last expression that was evaluated inside of that. So I get the paragraph object back from this monkey patch method on the other side. And we just do a little bit of testing to see if it was really a string or not, right? And if so, then I call this insert object thing which inserts the picture into the surface. Yes? Death methods? Um, yes. Yes, absolutely. Anything that you can do, right? You can, in Ruby, you can do with our, our types of. Will it live inside that execution of the engine, or will it undeath it from the C sharp class as well? So I believe your question is um, does it undeath it from the CLR's view of the world, or just from the Ruby view of the world? And it's only from the Ruby view of the world. Right, the CLR is still a statically type runtime, right? so we can't just walk up to types and remove things. Right? But what we can do from the Ruby view of that type is remove that, remove that, that method right, from, from our, our, our binder lookup. So we can certainly do some kind of funky things like that. So, so that's all pretty interesting, right? Like, you know, we, um, I think that these kinds of scenarios are really interesting for people, especially when you have an existing application. So we've been doing some experiments, um, um, you know, back of the ranch. Um, those experiments have us taking a very large chunk of compiled code like Visual Studio, 
right, and building extensions for Visual Studio inside of a dynamically typed language, right? So, so that turns out to be very interesting. If you've ever tried to build an extension for any IDE, not just Visual Studio, you know how painful that is, right? Because the, 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 the IDE is the thing that you're building, the thing that's hosting in, back in the thing, right? So you always have this multiple step painful process of building the thing, shutting down the IDE, bringing back the IDE again, or having multiple instances or some other crazy thing. Right? So, um, so again, this kind of script-driven development against a large chunk of statically um, compiled code right, turns out to be a nice way for adding extensibility points um, into, the, uh, into the applications that you're building as well. So there was um, step three. Now, so the next thing I want to show you is going to be uh, perhaps a little bit more adventurous. right? Um, and let's kind of take a look at, and it's so adventurous, in fact, that we needed to you know, shove the thing into its own house, um, which is right here. Now, some folks asked earlier, um, I believe during um, Charlie's talk, about what it's like for you from a statically typed language to go off and invoke methods right, inside of a dynamically typed language like Ruby. Right? Um, so one of the things that we recently announced if, a week or several months ago, depending on how you measure time, um, uh, is this new feature inside of C Sharp 4 called the dynamic feature. Right? So what dynamic allows us to do is it allows us um, to walk up to stuff. Right? So here what I've done in this little program here is I've pre-created a little chunk of Ruby code. Right? So you've already seen that stuff, Ruby create engine. Right? I'm going to execute and define a class C right, inside of um, inside of um, Iron Ruby, And of course, since that's the last thing that gets returned, right, you know, so the last expression of value is returned, so we have a reference to C, right, um, that's returned back to us. Now, what we can now do is um, we can walk back up to this, this engine, right, and inspect its variables, right, or its constants, if you want to talk in Ruby terms. I can scrape back out the C constant, Right, find the object reference that it's referred to, and I can do stuff with it now. Right? And now that I have compiler support inside of um, the language for doing these kinds of things, um, it looks a little bit better. It's not quite as beautiful as it could be right? because of keywords and silly things like that. Right? But I'll show you essentially what um, this stuff winds up looking like um, you know, when we do this. So let's, let's do that. Let's just hope I'm not paging the world in right now, which might happen. So, but the nice thing is I'm using Vim, right? So it, it's certainly a lot smaller than other things. So what I want to do is create a variable called class C, right? Notice that uh, the static type of this dynamically typed thing is dynamic. So I have class C. I'm going to walk up to our engine that I have up above there. And I'm going to go off and retrieve the variable. Now these are generic. DLR hosting interfaces. These are not Ruby specific things, right? So variable uh, makes sense in DLR terms, although it doesn't necessarily make sense in, in Ruby terms. Okay, so I'm going to go off and grab this thing. Now that I've got the class C reference, you can imagine that I can create an instance of this thing now, right? So I'm going to go off and this is uh, uh, the, the thing that's going to hold on to the instance. So really what I want to do is I want to invoke the new method, right? On, on the, the C. Unfortunately, since new is a C sharp keyword, right, we can escape um, um, you know, reserve words in C sharp with the at sign. And I can construct a new instance of this guy. All right, so I have that. And now that I have the instance, I can just go off and invoke stuff, right? So I can say, hello, oops, from Iron Ruby, right, like so. And if I just go off and build this thing, do a little bit of building, and I run the program, after paging in the world again, we see hello from Iron Ruby. Right? So certainly what we have here right, um, is a much nicer way for allowing us to, from a dynamically or statically typed language, to go off and invoke stuff inside of you know, um, a dynamically typed language. Now this works um, not just for um, Ruby. So, this, so what C Sharp is doing is it's using the DLR to go off and do all of the invocation against these, um, these dynamic entities on the other side. So all of the things that we get from the DLR, the call site caching stuff, right, is also um, being used and exploited inside of um, 
um, C Sharp to go off and, and talk to the languages on the other side. It might not necessarily be a Ruby thing. Um, one of the more important scenarios, I don't know if you've ever done office programming from C Sharp, but that's a very painful thing. Um, so this certainly makes it much easier to talk to COM-based objects. And you could argue that COM-based objects via iDispatch are really dynamically typed things, right? I can walk up and say, get me a member called Bob, right? And then go off and invoke the member called Bob, right? That's what iDispatch is all about. Um, and certainly it makes it much easier for languages, statically typed languages like C Sharp, to play inside of that world where I need to be able to go off and do dynamic invocation, right? Against existing big, large um, chunks of code. So, so this, is, um, so this is coming in C Sharp 4, um, which is part of the Visual Studio 2010 kind of wave of release of things. Um, and I think that this will be a, you know, a pretty fun thing, certainly for folks not just doing, you know, obviously office programming, but people that are interested in interopping with existing libraries of Ruby code um, from C Sharp. Now, so I can now make this VM go away, which will be awesome. Bye. Um, now, if C Sharp 4 wasn't enough for you, I'm going to show you C Sharp 5, right? Um, because we, you know, there's certainly more things, um, you know, um, up our sleeve. So there's been an effort. Um, the, the Iron Ruby team sits in um, a larger organization at Microsoft, which is our, our languages team. So the languages team is where we certainly have C Sharp and VB, and, um, as well as languages like Iron Python and F Sharp as well. Um, so we share a bunch of things. Um, one of the things that we're doing in um, the C Sharp team is rewriting the compilers. The compilers are originally written in C++, right, which made a lot of sense considering the heritage and the legacy of this thing. Um, the compilers are being rewritten inside of C Sharp itself. So what this makes possible is for us to go off and use a compiler as a service. So now that we have the ability to use a compiler as a service, we can now go off and do interactive C Sharp type things, right? So we can build REPLs for C Sharp, right? We should be able to get the same static typing goodness. It's still a statically typed language, right? But we can add a REPL experience. Um, so rather than being all dogmatic about should you be dynamic or should you be static, right, the idea is inside of C Sharp that you have the ability to kind of mix and match and, and go between the two worlds um, as you see fit. So what I wanted to show you is um, a slightly more sophisticated version of the REPL that I've been showing you um, up until now. And what this thing does is it has some key bindings and stuff in it to allow me to kind of toggle between the languages. So if I wanted to do um, something inside of C Sharp, all right, this is C Sharp, and notice I didn't need the trailing semicolon inside of there. Um, it's smart enough to figure that out. Um, I can go off and define a class inside of this thing. So I have class C here. Um, let's make this a public class so I can actually see it. Um, public string say hello. String dot format, right, hello, right, to uh, me. All right, so I can go off and define a C Sharp class um, from here. And uh, let's uh, also essentially go off and let's, once I've defined this thing, I can return a new instance of the C Sharp class after I've, I've defined it. So let's execute that. All right, so you'll notice I've got a little bit of syntax coloring and stuff inside of here as well. Um, so I've got class C, I can do say hello, and I've got this reference. Now, we're now in Ruby. Well, we're not really in Ruby, we're in a REPL, right? The REPL essentially has two key bindings, one that'll execute the code inside of Iron Ruby, and the other one that will execute the code inside of the C Sharp REPL that we have, right? Um, so as you know, um, inside of Ruby, right, the last expression that you've evaluated, right, is sitting inside of underscore. Um, so if I now execute that code inside of Ruby, you can see a Ruby-esque um, style thing at the bottom. Right, so again, interactively from this, uh, this guy, now I can walk up to this guy and say, um, say, hello, oops. To that, right? So I've gone off and inside of REPL, dynamically defined inside of a REPL, some C-sharp code, um, inside of Ruby, gone off and invoked that thing and brought the results back um, all the way. So that's a pretty interesting way of development, right? Again, this kind of very exploratory style of development, living inside of a REPL all the time hopefully trying to type the min set of things that you, you need to type in order to make things work. The C-sharp REPL also allows me to define methods of top-level scope as well, if that's what you want. Right, so again, I don't have to define the class, but in the case of where we're sitting right now, we kinda sorta have to do it to make it easier for us to do the demo, right? But that's just due to the state of our implementation. Um, but down the road, we'll certainly make it very easy for you to go off and invoke the method that's on the other side um, just the same. All right, now, the object that we have 
right, that, that we've got sitting um, inside of uh, underscore or D or whatever. Um, that object is a C-sharp object, and it behaves like a C-sharp object, right? You'll notice that it takes a string as a type, so we've done some conversion magic, right, to take a Ruby string and, you know, and convert it to the appropriate type, right, once it hits the C-sharp side of the house. But what if we wanted that guy to behave a little bit more like Ruby? Right, so you know that Ruby, right, when you take methods that take strings, there's some, you know, a lot of the things you do are these protocol conversions um, inside of Ruby, right? So if a method, um, if a, an object implements a toStir method, right, we'll go off and call toStir, right, automatically before, right, as part of the protocol conversion, right? So if we type this thing as object and wrote a bunch of code to introspect into object to see whether or not he implemented toStir, and if he did, then call it, and, right? That's a whole bunch of boilerplate code that you have to do over and over again. Um, you know, when you have to go off and build libraries that you want to integrate more seamlessly with Ruby, right? So you're not satisfied with these things just being C-sharp libraries, you want to kind of Rubify um, these libraries that you have on the other side. In an ideal world, right, what I would do is I would go off and type that class definition again and insert this little magical attribute that we're about to show you in a second. Um, but unfortunately, the C-sharp 5 compiler isn't done yet, right? Um, so it doesn't really understand attributes, and it was a little bit too much work um, for Tomash to go off and hack attributes into the C-sharp compiler um, just before this talk. So um, what I'm gonna do instead is I'm gonna statically compile this guy. So I've got this guy here, so let me show you REPL.CS. So this is the same method I showed you before, except that I have this default protocol attribute here. That guy there. Um, what the default protocol attribute is, this is what we use inside of our libraries, right? So we have, so what we're doing is, um, inside of our method binder, we look at the annotation, right, the, that, that we have inside of the default protocol attribute. We look at the type the, of the parameter that it's attached to. This is a parameter attribute. It's attached to a string. So we say, ah, we know what the default protocols, right, for converting to string are. We look for this toStir method, and we do the, the toStir set of um, conversions. So we've essentially codified this thing inside of an attribute we, which we can declaratively apply to our library methods. This is how we build things um, inside of the Iron Ruby libraries themselves. Right? But you can take advantage of the same things that we did um, in building the Iron Ruby libraries to make C-sharp libraries integrate more seamlessly um, back in with, um, um, with your Ruby applications. So what we'll do is we'll just simply compile this guy here. There's a build script inside there that generates REPL.DLL. So there's REPL.DLL that we just compiled there. Um, let's uh, get back out of here. And let's uh, run the thing again and let's require that guy. All right, so this thing is a .NET assembly, so C colon WAC, uh, what was it? Uh, BDC, Ruby REPL, scripts, REPL.DLL, right, was the name of that guy, so I've now grabbed that assembly. Um, I now need to create an instance of that guy and say hello, right, and we'll pass John, right, the simple thing, right, just to verify that the simple case does work. Now let's go off and define a new class, let's call it D, right, um, we'll define the toStir method on this guy, right, we'll say, you know, Mike, right in there, Right, we'll define D, right? Then I can go c.new.say hello to d.new. And we also have that automagical protocol thing that happened there, right? So I took a Ruby object that I created, right? An instance of the class D there, right? Constructed it, passed it in there, and we automatically called, um, we did the correct protocol conversion on the way in um, to our C-sharp methods, right? So again, it also makes it much easier for you to, you know, um, to integrate these things back in with your, um, with your world. All right, so, so we did that, we did that. Ah, okay, some more fun stuff to kind of you know, finish it all off. Um, so on the, the, the more fun side of the house, um, I guess it's been, what year is this now? This is 2008, right? So 2007, 2006, right? So two years ago um, was where I first kind of showed off this black thing, right, that, 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 that I like. Um, and uh, I'm gonna let a page in the world right now, it has to do a little bit of thinking right now, but, um, but the black thing is um, kind of interesting, right? Because it's this REPL, but it's a REPL built on top of a WPF surface. So in a WPF surface, it also makes it much easier for us um, to integrate other things like documentation right into the surface and, and render it in nice ways and that kind of stuff. Um, 
So what I have here is essentially all the RDoC stuff, right? Um, so, you know, I can go off and hit this key, right? We can look at the docs in line here. We can toggle this thing and bring it, you know, make it show up or hide. You know, but this is a relatively simple thing for me to go off and do. What's actually rather interesting about this thing is it does the right thing with different types. So depending on how good my network connectivity is, this is where we live dangerously, right? Right, so if I require MS Coralib and I include system, and I can go I disposable and trigger with the same hotkey. What this will now do is go off um, to, if the network gods are willing, um, it goes off to MSDN and, and scrapes the, uh, the documentation off of a web servers from, um, from the web. Since I didn't test this before I turn this thing on, maybe my wireless is busted. But anyways, um, what this will do is it will go off and pull, on, pull down and integrate arbitrary documentation um, from outside, <laughs> sweet. Um, you know, integrate arbitrary documentation from the outside world and drop it into here, right? So this is the same docs that you can view on the web if you search for this stuff. Um, and everything just shows up. And again, you can do this all interactively, right? So I've got some object reference. I do control F, right? It goes off and finds, determines the type of the thing and looks up the documentation for it, um, depending on whether or not it's a Ruby type or if it's a, you know, um, a .NET type. Right, so there's a lot of kind of cool things that we can go off and explore, um, you know, now that we have, you know, a nice surface, right, for us to go off and render things onto. All right, so I think there's some really um, interesting ideas that we can do here with contacts and stuff. So certainly anyone wants to talk to me about this stuff at the conference, I'm really interested in hearing your ideas because um, I think that there's a lot of fun things that we can do with, um, with an interactive REPL style of experience, you know, talking to um, your statically typed stuff, right, whatever that happens to be. So to finish things off, I will have my obligatory status slides, which unfortunately I haven't updated. So Tomas will be mad at me here because I didn't update some of these numbers. Um, we're doing better on the, the language um, specs. Um, uh, so on the language specs, we are passing on the order of 93% as opposed to 91, which is what that thing says. Um, the library specs were roughly unchanged. We're still at 78%, so we're not done doing this Ruby standard libraries. You know, so again, this is, you know, stuff that's actually not as horrible to implement as you might imagine, right? Um, given a lot of our um, declarative style of programming that we have inside of our code base. Um, so that's where we are in terms of the Ruby spec pass rate. Um, this is our performance numbers, right? So performance, like all things, it's a mixed bag. Um, sometimes we're better, sometimes we're worse. Those, that's the, uh, the Ruby 1.9 benchmark suite. Um, you know, the details of which ones are, you know, suck and which ones are awesome really aren't all that particularly interesting, right? Um, we really haven't had an opportunity to do any performance tuning at all. These are just our numbers right now, as is, you know, run like a couple of weeks ago. I'm um, using some random build. Um, you know, so like a lot of things is a mixed bag. We're still working on making sure we get the language right. And I think that our Ruby language conformance tests are, you know, are, you know, essentially showing the, our efforts in that area, um, sitting at 93% right now. Um, but we're gonna you know, drive that thing as, as high as possible, right, given the limitations of the CLR itself. Um, and uh, once we're done doing all that stuff, we'll start paying attention to some of those numbers. Per, you know, certainly the worst number, I think, there, the biggest red thing going off to the left, right, is our regex um, support right now. Right? So there's a whole bunch of things that you know, we know um, suck, and we will go off and fix those things one at a time um, when we get there. The other interesting thing about um, Iron Ruby is its size. Um, Right now, if you use a modern compression algorithm, 7-zip, um, um, we, uh, um, we compress down to 1.4 meg for Ruby and the DLR, right? So all five of those assemblies that I showed you earlier, oh, sorry, not just those guys, but the entire Ruby standard library that is all in Ruby form um, compresses down to 1.4 meg. Um, I suspect that that's not gonna grow by an awful lot. We'll certainly weigh in at less than two meg by the time we're done, um, you know, getting to 1.0. Um, but that's a pretty kind of encouraging result in terms of, you know, trying to keep things small and simple. Ah, yeah, okay, so I got one more hippie moment, right? This is my hippie moment. Um, so this is an interesting fact. This is a few years old, right, which is rather shocking depending on whether or not you look at these numbers uh, much at all. Um, but this is what the uh, DOE um, estimates in 2006. That's an awful lot of power that's being used by servers. Um, now, what's interesting is as, you know, this whole cloud thing and all that stuff starts showing up, um, it becomes interesting, right? Like, you want to optimize on different axes at different points in time during the, the kind of trajectory of your, your project, right? You know, certainly in the early days, you want to make sure you ship the thing, right? That's obviously the most important thing for you. But over time, right, migrating pieces of code over to uh, more efficient languages, let's call them that, right? 
you know, makes a lot of sense, right? Especially in the cloud where you're being billed by wall clock CPU hour, right? You now have a financial incentive to make sure that you're using as few of those cycles as possible on a per transaction basis, right? So starting off in a dynamically typed language, but having an easy migration path for the parts of your code that you should do, right? You know, migrate over to statically typed um, code um, as it makes sense is a very useful thing to do. Um, one thing that I thought was particularly interesting, we, we had our big developer shindig last week um, in Los Angeles. The top rated talk um, in all of PDC was a talk from some folks at MSR on, uh, that's Microsoft Research, on um, static verification of code, right? So you don't want to necessarily just go to um, statically typed languages just for so-called performance benefits, but you might want to go there because there are more sophisticated analysis tools um, that are available to you in a statically typed world than you have in a dynamically typed world. Right, so again, for the parts of your program that might be um, more critical, you, wanna, you might want to go off and, and migrate to a statically typed language so you have the ability to do static analysis across these things as well. Right, so not just the hippie stuff, but these other things are things that you can consider as well. So I have no idea how much time I have. Am I right on the, I think I'm right on the 45-minute the mark. Um, right now. So that's where we are, right? That's where our wiki lives. Um, we certainly, we're an open source project, all the usual stuff, right? I'm sure you guys know that by now. Um, you know, so, you know, we're very interested in having people, you know, help us, if not with just ideas, maybe code, right? Um, bug reports and fixes and those kinds of things are certainly welcome as well. Um, and I want to thank you guys for showing up here and let's open it up for questions if there are any time left. Yes, Mike. Nope. So how much performance so the question was, you know, how much faster, how much more awesome are we gonna get, right, once we start paying attention to this stuff? I don't know, right? You know, like like performance is this black art thing, right? Like you like performance in the scenarios that you care about are the things that matter. Right? So certainly, whole program performance is what people really care about. Micro benchmarks are very useful for compiler implementers, but not very useful as far as people that use a language are concerned. So that's really where bug reports really help. Right? You know, so you know, having you run your, your stuff in real applications and report back to us, all we have to do is hit some code path where we suck, right? and your overall performance is going to suck, and you're not going to be very happy with that. Um, so in terms of figuring out how much headroom that we have there, Hard to say. But certainly if you look at where Iron Python is, right, in a language that has had a lot of tuning um, relative to C Python, Iron Python is faster than C Python on micro benchmarks, right? Um, you know, uh, we've done some other things with some other languages um, inside of the lab as well. So we have some very encouraging performance numbers with um, more popular dynamic languages, let's say, um, that we've we've investigated in terms of seeing how fast we can push the CLR to go things. So You'll have to wait until we have the results, right? Is probably the best thing to say. I'm not going to make up numbers here, right? Because that's not going to be very useful. Yep. Uh, what's the community like? Do you have many patches coming in from the outside? Yeah, we have some patches coming in from the outside. You know, almost all of our numerical support was written by Peter Bacon Darwin, um, who really likes numbers, which we're very happy about. Um, you know, certainly what we've seen is that the bar to um, the barrier to contribute is relatively high, and for some of the reasons are our own fault. Right? We maintain two source code repositories, which really sucks, right? And, and, and that's an artifact of our big testing infrastructure that we have inside of the company. And you know, one of my, my, my top line things I really want to do when we get back to the, the ranch is um, figure out how to fix that problem, right? We really want to get to a single repo. We will most likely move off of SVN onto Git when we do that. Um, you know, it just it makes sense for us to do this, right? What it means is the bottom line is pain has to be felt somewhere. The question is, where should the pain be felt? Right? Should it be felt on the inside of the company, or should it be felt on the outside? Right now, the pain is felt on the outside, right? because there's a lag between our internal commits, our internal source control, and to the time stuff gets on the outside. Um, and you know, two-way merges and that are just not fun. right? So it's really who wants to do the merging, and where does the merging happen? Right? And that, that's really kind of what happens. Because right? we build on top of stuff that's changing. Right, so that's the other thing, right? The DLR is changing, the CLR underneath that thing is changing as well, right, with the next version of CLR. So there's always the v.next of some other thing that we depend on, right, that sits somewhere inside of the, the chain, right? So it's, that's where it comes back to, right, where you want to feel the pain. So that, that's our big thing. We want to make it much easier for folks on the outside to, to contribute. Yeah? Is there most of the way of plans for making the DLR more first class in the .NET world as far as the tool, the tool set of so the question was, are there plans to make the DLR more of a first-class citizen? Oh, 
I see what you mean. OK, yeah. So, so yeah. So we already have, I, I could have shown you that. I didn't think this crowd would be particularly interested in seeing File New Ruby Project, but we do have File New Ruby Project working inside of Visual Studio today. We've got some rudimentary syntax coloring working in there. Um, you know, this extension model that we're talking about experimenting with, you know, where you can build extensions to Visual Studio inside of Ruby. We've got some, you know, prototypes of that stuff as well. So we are definitely working on those things. Um, and we definitely want to make sure that, you know, at some point in the future, right, for Visual Studio 2010, it's too late, right, for us to get on that, that boat. But, you know, for whatever the version after that's going to be called, you know, that's certainly in the plans right now. Well, more, sure. It's like 1.4 progress on 7, 2 minutes, 1.4 meg, 2 minutes, this size. Yep. What's the runtime cost? Okay, so the question was, so, so we're 1.4 meg on, 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 on size of the bytes on disk, right? How much memory do we consume right now? Oh, we really suck at that right now. So, um, so in terms of memory consumption, uh, we're on the order of 2x worse than, um, than JRuby is right now. Um, we know where a lot of that is, and we know how to cut that out. We just haven't done the work yet. Um, so we've done the measurements to know where, where that sits. So our goal certainly is, like, there's no reason why we shouldn't be able to get down to JRuby numbers um, in, um, in terms of our working set. Um, and, uh, yeah, so that's, that's all kind of tied into that. Yep? So the question was, what about Ruby 1.9 compatibility? Um, certainly the place where we've done the most work in that is inside of our string implementation, right, with, uh, with an I4 to the, um, the internationalization of the multinationalization stuff inside of 1.9. Um, so that's where we've done a lot of work. We've got an experimental 1.9 flag um, inside of uh, Iron Ruby today um, that you can enable if you want to try um, a few features. Um, but we really haven't been tracking it, right? We're, you know, we're still trying to get 1.86 to, to work right. So, so that's really where most of our energy is, is focused, but we are looking forward in cases where it makes sense, like in strings um, on that. Am I out of time? I'm out of time. Okay, thank you very much.